Australia, the big, dry continent where more than 80% of the population live in coastal towns and cities. Each summer brings 5 million people to the seaside, to a stunning 12,000 miles of the finest coastline in the world, a coastline with the ever-presence of sharks. The most dangerous shark areas are along the densely populated eastern seaboard. Australians are the most shark conscious people in the world. And no wonder. There are more shark attacks in Australian waters than in any other part of the world. The North American coastline is the second most dangerous shark area. During the last half century, there have been 152 unprovoked attacks there. In the same 50 years, Australia has recorded 278 unprovoked attacks. Sounds bad, doesn't it? But what are the actual odds of being taken by a shark? They are less than the chances of being struck by lightning. On average, there's less than one fatal shark attack in Australia per year, while there are dozens of fatal road accidents every weekend. But the possibility of being caught in a strange environment and eaten alive is always more horrifying than the infinitely greater chance of being killed by a fellow motorist. And yet, comforting as the statistics are, only a brave man or a fool is thinking of statistics when he's up to his neck in water and someone yells, shark. Water to Australians is like snow to Eskimos. They learn to swim almost as soon as they learn to walk and become almost fearless of water. In days, the sea becomes a vast playground. But in all their sunny frivolity, there's an element of fear. Possibly the slight but ever-present threat of sharks adds to the excitement of water activities. To most Australians, the Oceanside is the ideal retreat for carefree relaxation. For a few, like producer Henry Borse, it provides a far quieter, lonelier retreat.
Henry slips into a hypnotic world of slow motion and silence. An expert diver, he finds rare freedom in another dimension, observing a world hidden to most. Henry prefers to explore with a camera rather than hunt. Kingdom of Green, home of a horde of curious dangers. Sea urchins with poisonous spines. The stingray, armed with a vicious serrated barb at the base of its tail. Hundreds of threats lurk here, but none compete with that king of danger, the shark. The shark's ancestors first appeared in prehistoric oceans during the Devonian age, 400 million years ago. The original shark has the same amazingly efficient torpedo-like body shape as they do today and were up to 20 feet long. In the Miocene age, 20 million years back, the shark was particularly abundant and enormous. Some were 60 feet long with teeth as big as a man's hand. Throughout its life, the shark is driven by two urges. The urge to survive and the urge to procreate. Almost all shark's activity is linked directly with that of its prey, rendering his behavior almost completely predictable. If all its feeding and mating habits are observed, an accurate prediction can be made of its movements. Should a man, for example, be in the path of a hunting shark, he could very well be inviting a so-called unprovoked attack. Hungry sharks are not particularly inclined to differentiate between man and other edibles. So the official classification of unprovoked attack is in this light almost meaningless. Even so, the fear and infamy of this lordly survivor of eons of time has inevitably led to the popular saying, the best shark is a dead one. But this villain of the deep is also a very useful creature. Its skin, for example, covered with tiny teeth-like projections, is so abrasive it was once used for sandpaper. Shark skin produces a tough, durable leather useful for a wide range of goods. 
For centuries, a traditional use of the skin, utilizing its natural characteristic, has been the making of sword handles. It is said even a coating of fresh blood over the skin will not make the grip slippery. The most accurate means of identifying the species are the shark's teeth. The stiletto type for grabbing and swallowing small fish like these of a gray nurse. And the serrated meshing variety designed to sever large chunks from its prey like those of the whaler and white pointer. Dependent on a complete set of dentures, nature helps to ensure its survival with an amazing bank of reserved teeth. Within 24 hours of losing a tooth, the next one in line starts to grow into a position to replace it. Primitive man, living on the shores of shark-inhabited waters, often expressed his awe and fear in myths and totems of shark gods and shark demons. Some tribes still worship the shark as their spirit ancestor and also have adapted the shark's main offensive, its teeth, to form the lethal part of their weapons. These weapons are so effective that warriors on the Gilbert and Alice Islands had to protect themselves with suits of coconut fiber armor. The teeth are perforated and tied into a groove along the edge of the sword. Traditionally, the cord used was made from pubic hair, but these days, manufacture being primarily for the tourist, common string has done away with this rather demanding tradition. Fishing for sharks is a very popular and highly competitive sport. Among big game fishermen, the shark is considered the most exhilarating and challenging of game fish. Two well-known experts are TV personalities Bob and Dolly Dyer. Between them, they hold the majority of world records for tiger and white pointer caught by line. 16 at last count. One of Bob's records was a 15 and a half foot white pointer. He hauled it on board using a 50 pound breaking strain line. The monster weighed 1,876 pounds. That takes a fair bit of know-how. And the sport itself takes a fair bit of money. A special flag is flown to indicate which variety of game fish is about to be brought into the weighing station. champion white shark fisherman, making careful preparations. Elf uses whale oil to lay an alluring, provocative slick that the shark can pick up miles away. The slow dripping oil entices the shark to the boat where he finds the tasty lures hanging from the stern. The lures act as a teaser and arouses the shark sufficiently in order for him to snap up the baited hook.
prowess as a shark fisherman is nothing short of incredible. By catching the four largest fish ever taken on rod and reel, each a white pointer and each weighing more than a ton, he four times consecutively broke his own world record to leave it standing at 2,664 pounds with a 16 foot 10 inch white shark. This 13 foot monster carefully inspects the baited hook before finally taking the challenge. As soon as Alf sets the hook, the enraged shark tries to roll free of the line. This is where the skill of the big game fisherman is put to the test. The boat must be kept moving so the line doesn't tangle in the rigging. If Elf doesn't anticipate the shark's every move and loses his balance for one second, he could be overboard amongst some very angry sharks. Inch by inch, the shark is brought in to where it can be pulled to the boat by the steel trace. Great care must be taken here should the shark make a final desperate bid for freedom. Hooking to landing, this shark has lasted 45 minutes. From seven white pointers swimming around the boat, Alf accurately predicted which one would take the bait. Attentively, the sharks circle the boat. Circling sharks have become excited and aggressive. They begin to snap at almost everything, from a submerged cine camera to the boat itself. does this one ignore the bait, but he shows a more than enthusiastic interest in the camera cage. The situation doesn't allow for the slightest error in judgment.
of meat in a few savage bites and the best cuts of meat too in the gill area richest in blood cannibalism like this is common the shark usually circles slowly then nudges its prey before the mayhem of the feeding frenzy begins but when competing for the same snack he'll swim straight in snapping at everything that gets in his way including other sharks Like man, the shark usually falls prey only to its own kind. A study of the anatomy of the shark gives us some insight into the creature's uniquely successful reign of the sea for so many hundreds of millions of years. The lateral line system picks up the erratic, low-frequency impulses set up by struggling fish or a man. Electrolytic alterations in the water are registered by the ampules of Lorenzini, a number of gelatine-filled sacs which detect the electrolysis created by the acidic action of blood, perspiration, or urine in seawater. The claspers are the male shark's reproductive organs, and nature has endowed him with two, Unlike fish, salations, or sharks and rays, have intercourse, which can last up to 20 minutes. The shark's liver is quite enormous, sometimes weighing as much as 450 pounds, or one-fifth of the creature's weight. The shark stores nutrients here, enabling it to live without food for several weeks. The high vitamin A content of the liver used to make shark fishing a lucrative business until the development of synthetic vitamins wiped the industry out. In its fight for freedom, this one tore up seaweed from the bottom. Its stomach also contains the remains of what once was a six-foot snapper shark. The digestive juices produced by the stomach wall are so strong that they would eventually dissolve metal. However, to enable it to swim unencumbered when speed is needed, the shark can invert and empty its stomach. A second stomach, somewhat like a spiral staircase, replaces approximately 75 feet of digestive intestinal tract with an ingenious 24-inch organ. This and nine feet of intestines forms an incredibly efficient digestive system, considering that man has to carry some 137 feet of intestine. The small two-chambered heart is presently the object of research into human heart failure.
Rodney Fox, who very nearly lost his life to a shark, spends much of his free time taking his revenge. While competing in a state spearfishing competition, a white pointer savagely tore Rodney through the water, all but crushing his chest. Miraculously, the shark let go before any vital organs were severed. A spearfishing competition is almost like a carefully prepared enticement to sharks in the vicinity. Large numbers of bleeding fish hang from floats in the water for up to six hours. Continuous streams of violent vibration waves transmitted from the struggles of wounded fish send any nearby shark rushing to the competition site. Yet Rodney has not only returned to compete at spearfishing competitions, but became the outright winner of this one. Brian Roger, another shark victim, was attacked in a similar competition in almost the same spot as Rodney. Brian has also returned to competition spearfishing, and this six and a half pound lobster was easily the largest caught. Rodney's scars are an everlasting reminder of the horrible injuries the shark can inflict. Both Rodney and Brian were attacked near the South Australian town of Aldinga. Brian's thoughts wander as he surveys the spot where rescuers brought him ashore after a shark viciously tore at his thigh. Determination and many hours of physical exercise have retained for Brian the full use of his mutilated leg. Any shark attack makes headlines, but Raymond Short's misfortune was one of particular horror. Raymond was a healthy, active boy of 13, holidaying with his parents at Coaldale, New South Wales. He was splashing in the crowded surf in only four feet of water when the jaws of an eight-foot shark clamped around his legs. It had to be beaten to death with a surfboard before it relinquished its grip. Raymond was then carried to the hospital, which is only 500 yards from the beach. He survived. And on the day of his release from hospital, he was presented with a gift. The dried jaws of his attacker. But the real memento of that day, the boy will carry with him for the rest of his life. Here's Raymond with another lucky shark victim, Darcy Lorenz. Darcy was attacked 30 years ago while surfing on a rubber float only two miles from Coaldale. 
The shark took one big bite, neatly removing a large piece of Darcy's seat. It took 150 stitches to repair the damage. It's easy to understand a surviving shark victim being left with a fear of the sea. But most of them go back. Raymond Short has retained his life-saving membership and is now a keen member of a spearfishing club. As six shark victims in seven consecutive years were participating in an underwater sport of some kind, a great deal of attention was drawn to the anti-shark gun, or powerhead. Either a 303 or 12-gauge cartridge is loaded in a short barrel. The firing pin is spring-loaded and discharge is affected by the impact of the weapon striking a solid object. Contrary to common belief, it's not the projectile that is lethal, but the gas expansion of the exploding charge, which causes a sudden disintegration of the brain tissues. If the brain is struck, it causes instant death. However, few, if any, victims have seen their attacker approach. The powerhead's value is mainly psychological. The frightening mass attacks on shipwreck victims and ditched airmen in World War II gave rise to a research program by the United States Navy. Copper acetate simulates the smell of decaying shark. Most species dislike this smell and avoid the source. Following this discovery, researchers constructed a pack for seamen and airmen to carry, consisting of 20% copper acetate and 80% nigrison dye. The dye surrounds the person's body and hides it from the man-eaters. These shark repellent packs have certain disadvantages. The duration of effectiveness can be rather limited. Any current will quickly disperse the dye and smell. Also, some species of shark, under certain conditions, do not appear to be the slightest bit concerned about the smell or the dye, and attack regardless. But the packs are still standard equipment, because they offer the airmen and seamen some sense of security, even if mostly psychological. major advance made by the United States Navy in their continuous search for the perfect shark protection is the anti-shark bag.
By separating the man from the water around him and obscuring his odor and movements from the shark's senses, it can protect a man from menacing sharks for an unlimited period. The person is suspended in a black plastic bag which is filled with water and in turn suspended on an inflatable collar. Test reports so far are extremely promising. The shark shows little interest in this strange black object. But the device has yet to be tried against the ferocious man-eating white shark. So its full life-saving potential is not yet known. In the battle to prevent shark attacks, any observed and correctly interpreted behavior patterns can be relevant. Here at Tweed Heads, on the border of New South Wales and Queensland, the slower moving bottom feeding varieties are kept for public show. As 70% of the Earth's surface is water, man may eventually have to live and work on the seabed, where lie rich, untapped resources. But before this can happen, he may yet learn much from the ocean's bad boy, who has survived there successfully longer than any other vertebrate. The leopard shark and the grey nurse are two species that have settled in at Tweed Heads quite readily. They adapt very quickly to daily hand feeding. However, being strictly a creature of habit, the diver has to be alert to anything unexpected. Because any incident not part of the learned response can quickly transform Mr. Shark from docile to savage. Elaborate oceanarium is marine land in the Sydney suburb of Manly. The curator, Jeff Goatby, takes a great interest in the behavior of sharks under his care. In particular, the dreaded whaler shark, which has been responsible for the greatest number of attacks along the Sydney beaches. Marine land is large enough to keep this fast swimming shark in captivity. Unfortunately, the shark is quick in adapting himself to the new environment. Once he realizes that food is offered regularly by the same diver each evening, he becomes more docile and swims peacefully with fish that would under normal conditions become his prey. The necessity to hunt has been taken from him. Of 250 species of shark known, only about 12 are dangerous to man. The white pointer, tiger, whaler, grey nurse and wabigong sharks are the only five species of concern to the Australian people. Only three of these, the whaler, nurse and wabigong, will live in the confines of an oceanarium so the public may observe them from safety.
As the summer holidays commence, thousands of swimmers take to the water. A shark spotter plane, sponsored by a local radio station, takes off twice daily to warn bathers should there be sharks in their vicinity. The reporter broadcasts traffic, boating, and surfing conditions, while the Cessna cruises at an altitude of 500 feet, patrolling about 120 miles of beaches. He doesn't seem as if he will. No, he's turning out again now. He seems to be turning out to the deeper water once again. And so we'll, uh, we'll leave him here for the moment. We'll keep our eye on him as we circle in the vicinity and keep you posted as to what he does. But do be very careful if you're swimming anywhere near Elwood. Stay right out of the water. The shark is a big one. He's very close in. As soon as the shark uh, retreats to deep water, the, the pilot cuts the siren. In the water until we're able to give you the all clear. Bathers can safely return to the cool water. A most effective protection for young bathers are the bar-protected sea baths. Whether people seek these enclosures for shark protection or for the modern shower facilities is debatable. The stout steel bars protects the enclosure from sharks and stingrays. The coating of crustaceans and weeds make these bars even more effective.
However, not everyone swims inside the bars. It would seem impossible to protect the keen swimmer who seeks the powerful surf. But since meshing was introduced to Australia in 1937, not one attack has taken place off a meshed beach. Bob Grunsell, skipper of the Reliance, has the government shark meshing contract for the east coast city of Newcastle. Seven o'clock each morning sees Bob and his two hands taking their nets to set off the six main surf beaches of Newcastle. Each net measures a thousand feet long and 20 feet high as it floats upright off the bottom. Nets are set parallel to the beach between two 60-pound anchors just outside the surf. As sharks can only swim forward, once they swim into the eight inch mesh, they're stuck. The more he thrashes around to free himself, the more tangled he becomes. Sharks of the dangerous kind must swim continuously throughout their lifespan in order to ventilate their gills. As soon as forward motion stops, the shark begins to drop. This large whaler has been dead for some time. Her litter of a dozen young were stillborn. Bob cuts the jaws from the sharks before dumping the carcasses out at sea. It takes some time to properly treat each jaw before they finish up at schools and with curio collectors. Nets at the Gold Coast Resort of Coolangatta reach from bottom to surface. Sharks that have entangled themselves like this hammerhead can only be released by cutting the nets. The resulting damages causes considerable and expensive repairs. But to the tourist trade, the compensation of carefree swimming is more than worth it. Some less harmful creatures, such as this leopard ray, are usually released by the fishermen, as they're of little danger to bathers.
Although the very word shark conveys thoughts of fear and biting, slashing teeth, he's a very valuable commodity to man. Fishing the shark for human consumption is carried out for most Australian towns bordering the Bass Strait regions. Fishing boats will travel many miles to find the school, gummy, and saw sharks, which are the most palatable of sharks. Part of the traveling time is utilized to prepare the bait. Fresh kuta and eels are chopped up in sections and threaded onto the many hooks, which are set in more than 200 feet of water. The baited hooks with their short snoods are prepared in boxes of 80, ready to attach to the main line before the first light of dawn. One mile of line is fed to the ocean bottom at a time. The fishermen clip the baits on at 20 feet intervals, giving each set a potential catching power of 240 sharks. But a catch of 40 per set is considered excellent. Skipper Ray Dickey and Graham, his offsider, can shoot a set in approximately 10 minutes. After laying two sets, they'll return to haul in the first one. As it takes about an hour to haul a set, it doesn't pay to leave the lines for too long, as larger species or vermin, such as crabs, which are abundant at these depths, inevitably mutilate the catch. Although these school sharks are not of a species considered dangerous to man, handling takes considerable skill as they're quite capable of inflicting an injury while freeing the hooks. These adult sharks seldom grow larger than about five feet and provide a tasty boneless meat of high protein content. Don rebates and prepares each hook for the next set so that up to 10 sets can be shot in one day. With only three crew members, a systemized routine is necessary. The drum winch pulls in the line automatically and recoils itself into the hold so it may be reset without falling.
prefers to anesthetize his patients before dressing them for the dinner table. When handling around 200 sharks in one day, it's not advisable to take chances with that many teeth. for a shark to give birth on deck. These sharks are born live and fully prepared to fend for themselves at birth. Graham's assistance reveals a litter of 37 wriggling youngsters. After a premature birth, this youngster retains the yolk sac from which it drew its nutrition while growing inside the mother. Few survive the many perils awaiting them. Shark used to be sold under many pseudonyms, such as deep sea cod or French herring, to overcome some of the early prejudices against eating shark meat.